Section One. You will hear a young student, Andrew, ringing an employment agency, inquiring about their services. First, you have some time to look at questions one to seven. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Hello, is this the Triple A Employment Agency? Yes. Hi, I rang before. My name's Andrew, Andrew Peterson. I rang you earlier and gave you my personal details. The student's name is Andrew Peterson. So Peterson has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions one to seven. Hello, is this the Triple A Employment Agency? Yes. Hi, I rang before. My name's Andrew. Andrew Peterson. I rang you earlier and gave you my personal details. If you remember, I'm that student looking for work during the summer holidays. Oh, sure. Actually, I have your file right here, but we still need to add some further information. Yeah, that's what they told me, and that's why I'm ringing. What do you need to know? Well, we have to know your main level of education. It's a degree, I suppose. Yes, but I'm still doing it in engineering. It's quite interesting. Some of my friends are studying computing, though, so I'm interested in that also. Well, I'll just write in your main degree subject, engineering. We usually have a demand in computing, though. Have you worked with computers before? No, I just do some programming for fun at the university. But I almost got a job as a computer designer once. Actually, the only job I've ever had was as a car salesman. Believe it or not. Well, at least you've had experience dealing with customers. What about hobbies, though? Sometimes they can help develop useful skills. Um, in my free time, I don't do much. Mostly study. I play chess occasionally at the university chess club. That's right next to the tennis courts. But I'm not interested in that. Chess helps develop analytical skills, so I'll put that down. Of course, it's your main skills that employers want to know about. What would you say they are? Well, I'm in my third year now, studying electrical machines and generating systems. But I'd say electronics is my best skill, much better than, say, my machine skills, which aren't so good actually. Okay, machine skills are in demand, but so too are electronic ones. So we might be able to find your part-time job in that field. But what sort of money do you expect to get? Oh, anything really. I'd want the standard payment, let's say. What's normal? One thousand a month? One thousand five hundred? I'll just put one thousand two hundred dollars, okay? That's fine by me. When can you start? Say within two days? Easily, actually less. In fact, just give me a ring and I'll be able to start immediately. Although I admit it'll take me a few days to get used to getting up early in the morning. Okay, that's just about it. Unless you'd like to add anything else, which may help with your application. Ah,、uh, not really. I ride a motorbike, but that's unimportant. I'm friendly, but every applicant claims that, right? I can speak another language. Ah, that might be useful. Depending on the language, is it Chinese? A Chinese speaker would go down well. Spanish, I'm afraid. You see, I grew up with some friends who came from South America. Okay, I'll write that down. But I don't think it will help that much. Sorry to say. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions eight to ten.
Now listen and answer questions eight to ten. Well, thanks for your help, and hopefully I'll get a job soon. But can I just ask one more question? Sure. What basically are employers looking for when they interview someone? Oh, many things. Being hardworking, diligent, and focused on your job is good. But surprisingly, it often means you can't see the bigger picture, or provide suggestions which help the company move forward. That requires thinking for yourself, outside the box, as they say, and being free of the standard ways of approaching tasks. Employers certainly value that. I guess experience must help, though. It depends. If it involved a routine job, one which didn't exercise your mind, it might not mean that much at all. But since companies are basically composed of people, it is important to be able to get along with others. There's no point in hiring someone whom the other employees don't like, right? That just causes problems. In fact, I would say that being friendly and approachable ranks far more highly than your academic qualifications. Okay, and that's all assessed at the interview, right? Yes, and your qualifications, experience, and approach to the job, such as whether you can do different things, work overtime, or do long hours, is needed. But those latter qualities are pretty much standard. What may be more important is based on the fact that things inevitably go wrong. Mistakes are made, and someone's got to fix them in a way that creates the least disturbance. People with demonstrated abilities to do this are certainly regarded highly. I see. That's very interesting. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section two. You will hear the manager of a fitness centre giving information about the centre to some new customers. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Fit for Life Health Centre, a place which, as the name suggests, is not just for short-term solutions, but rather intends to put you on a sensible and achievable footing for the rest of your life. And that's how we're different. For example, we could immediately put you on a harsh exercise program, expecting you to work out every day. But such a plan would see you quickly lose interest. That's why the initial step is a one and a half hour consultation in which your lifestyle, current situation, and long term goals are all thoroughly analysed. Now, an important part of this consultation involves analysing what you eat. There's no point exercising here and losing weight, then putting it all back on later. You will need to show self-control and discipline in your diet, and we'll work on that. Similarly, we'll put you on an exercise regime suitable for your level of fitness. So that will involve a test where we will take you through some activities, then measure your heart rate and blood pressure to determine how fit you are. This will be monitored during every subsequent consultation, along with your exercise schedule. And that occurs monthly and not half yearly, as with many other centres. As to our actual exercise machines and programmes, you will have to decide whether it is muscle mass, stamina, or general fitness that you want to develop. Think about which of these three you want to target, and we'll design a specific programme for you. But remember, bulging muscles aren't necessarily suitable for everyone. Sometimes it's better to think in terms of two simple concepts: muscle definition and stamina, or if you are female, being fit and healthy, in both mind and body. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty.
Now listen and answer questions sixteen to twenty. Now, if you're going to work out at this gym, you'll need to think about your reasons for exercising. So let's consider that in more detail. Muscle mass is certainly popular with the guys, probably seeking to impress the girls, and with muscles comes the confidence to do that, right? Well, for that you'll need our high-stress weight units, where pumping iron is all the rage. Moving on to other benefits, one of the main ones is beating the tension of life, right? And the longer the exercise is, the greater the rewards in this respect. Thus, playing squash can certainly help, and so can swimming. But what's much better, as every jogger will tell you, is their activity. So we have ample jogging machines, and they're always popular. They can provide good fitness too, as can the yoga classes. However, again, let's not forget playing squash, which I would say is the optimum way to improve your general well-being. Such an active, energetic game, plus the competitive element, drives you forward into high levels of health and fitness. These, of course, are the ultimate purposes of being here. But remember, the centre is full of like-minded people, all of whom are interesting to meet and valuable sources of information. The yoga classes have a pre- and post-meeting session, so you'll certainly meet others there. Although they'll all be yoga enthusiasts, which limits the range somewhat. But whether doing yoga, swimming, or exercising, everyone showers, right? So those facilities are where you'll hear all sorts of interesting conversations and really get to know people. Not like the front desk area, which is mostly empty as patrons go immediately inside to do their exercise. Of course, the front desk can answer all your questions and has information brochures and such like. But for knowing more about a greater variety of subjects and community concerns, look at the notice board in the yoga studio, where there's a huge array of papers, leaflets, and articles, all for you to read and consider. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section three. You will hear two faculty directors talking about which person in their university to promote. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Now listen carefully, and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-five. Okay, we've got to decide who to promote to leading education officer. Someone from the arts faculty, I suppose. Well, it can be from any faculty, since the position requires more general skills: handling personnel, settling disputes, and motivating them to focus on the task. It was the last position which involved computer knowledge, not this one. Surely, computer knowledge would help. So too would knowledge in the arts. Sure, it would help. But the key criterion is being able to direct the staff appropriately. So it doesn't matter then from which faculty we select our candidates. Not really. But I've already looked at those from computing and rejected them all. Why? They're all too new. Lacking in sufficient experience, whereas these ones from the business faculty are long timers. So we'll take someone from there. I suppose you're right. The arts faculty doesn't present much in the way of suitable candidates either. But we'll still have to train the person, teach the ropes, as they say, and he or she will have to expect to do overtime as needed. Of course, 
It can get so busy that if we were open on the weekend, they'd have to work then as well. Just as well, we're a Monday to Friday university, right? Right, but are you sure these people will actually want the job? The salary isn't such an improvement on their current ones. I know, but there are benefits. You get overtime rates, a nice place to put your car, as well as additional petrol money if you drive for company purposes, which they'll probably be required to do. But those benefits are quite limited, especially given all the work and responsibility involved. People often don't like that. They prefer the creative freedom of less senior teaching positions. Yeah, I know. But these candidates should realise that if they do this job well, there'll be more promotions down the line. You know how everyone likes having their own office, right? Sure. Well, that would come after a few years if they're prepared to work hard and grow with the university. Yes, that should attract these people. Before you hear the rest of the conversation. You have some time to look at questions twenty-six to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-six to thirty. Well, that's enough talk about the job. What about the actual candidates? How many do we have? Ah,、uh, I've narrowed it down to four. Ah,、uh, just using their first names. That's Stephen, Abdul, Lek, and Oscar. As you said, there's quite a bit of experience between them, about thirty-four years in all. What's the exact breakdown of figures? Abdul and Stephen both have seven years. Lek has one more, and Oscar is the most experienced at twelve. But who's the most qualified? Stephen and Abdul have an MBA. Oh, sorry, Abdul's got something called a MBP, some foreign thing which translates as Master of Business Practice. I'm not sure what that is, but does he do the job well? Very well, apparently. Better than Lek and Oscar, who hold a degree and some certificates, respectively. But we have to think about any drawbacks, you know, possible issues with any of them. I asked the respective deans for feedback, and I found out that Stephen, the younger one, drinks a bit. So he has a problem with alcohol. No, he never drinks to excess, but at the bar he's often expressed his intention of moving on, of teaching abroad. Ah, he's not stable. Not stable at all, apparently. We'll never know for how long he'll hold the job. We need stable personnel. And people without family problems or sick relatives, like the last guy we promoted. What about Abdul? Then will he do? He might do, except his English language ability is limited. It's functional but a bit broken, and meaning is sometimes lost. That's not the problem with the next candidate, Lek, who has good language ability. But this job involves handling people, and his dean says Lek's attitude is bad. In what way? His manners are okay, and he's interested in his job, but he believes there should always be adequate leisure in life. He definitely won't work overtime, and complains a lot already about his job. But this last candidate, Oscar, is probably not the right one either. Why not? Not another problem with language. His first language isn't English, but he speaks it well enough. He's stable with a good attitude, but his age is the problem. Age is not a problem. That would be ageism. And I don't believe in that. But with his age comes health problems as well, and serious ones at that. Oh, that might be an issue then. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Part four. You will hear part of a presentation about the early history of salt. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty.
Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In my presentation, I'm going to talk about salt. In modern times, when we talk about salt, people may associate it with high blood pressure or increased heart risk, and many health experts warn that we should use less salt in our meals and dishes. However, we should not ignore its importance in our cuisine and even in early human history. Salt is one of the oldest, most ubiquitous food seasonings. The taste of salt is one of the basic human tastes. More importantly, salt plays an indispensable role in the health of human beings. For example, it regulates the body's acid-base balance. Because of its importance to survival, salt has often been considered a valuable commodity during human history. This can be tracked all the way back to ancient Greece, ancient Egypt and ancient Rome, when salt was highly valued and used as a method of trade and currency. In ancient Rome, the busiest road leading to the city was the Via Salaria, which means the salt route in English. A soldier's pay, which partly consisted of salt, was known as salarium argentum in Latin, from which we derived the English word salary. A soldier's salary was cut if he was not worth his salt, an expression still used today. In fact, salt was not only the first condiment discovered, but also the first preservative. We know today that food goes bad because microorganisms in the food multiply in abundance, and a high salt environment is not conducive to microbial reproduction. Extremely high concentrations of salt can even kill microorganisms in the food. The ancients certainly didn't know this, but they did know that salted food can be preserved for a long time. The use of salt as a preservative can be traced to ancient Sweden. At first, hunting was the principal means of livelihood. In this case, meat supplies were unlikely to be frequent. What's more, fewer animals were available for hunting. In order to ensure the supply of meat, many families in Sweden began to raise animals in the surrounding forests during the summer, when the weather was suitable for animals to survive. These animals were fed every day until about three to four months later. That's in October. They were ready to be butchered for meat, and that was the only month when ancient Swedish people had fresh meat on their table. Then, with the continuous increase in productivity, people finally had some meat left. However, how to store the meat had become a headache until someone invented a whole new way to preserve food, salting. People tried to keep meat from going bad by adding some salt to it, and it could be preserved for several months and even years. There was evidence that salt was widely used to preserve meat. Historical documents in 1573 recorded the Swedish king's everyday meals mentioning that 175 pounds of meat was consumed each year, but over 150 pounds was salty. From this, we can clearly see the importance of salt in Sweden at that time. In addition, the documents also noted the annual sales of beer in Sweden soared during that period, and this must be related to high levels of salt in their food. Now. Let's turn to the sources of salt. Where is salt from? Well, salt is common in nature. It has long been found that salt can be extracted from seawater, mineral deposits, saline lakes, brine, spring, etc., among which the two most important ones are oceans and basins. On the floor of the latter often lie deserts where traces of salt can be found, such as the Sahara. Furthermore, the quality of different salt types varies a lot. For example, salt from seawater is always mixed with impurities, so after the salt is dried, the sediments and other chemicals need to be purified before eating. However, this is not the case with salt from spring water. We can hardly find any impurities, and the salt level is much more concentrated. Then, how did people distribute salt around the world? Of course, in modern times, we have various ways of transporting goods, but in ancient times, it was not the case. Take ancient Sweden, we mentioned before, as an example. Because of the heavy use of salt in the diet, 
Sweden could not feed itself and had to import large amounts of salt from other countries. In order to make sure they could buy enough salt from abroad, the Swedish had to attach great importance to shipping and keep it undamaged, as it was the most crucial way at that time. While in other ancient countries, in order to distribute salt to other places, groups of men were employed. They put bags of salt on their shoulders or backs and moved them to the surrounding regions. And gradually, these people were considered as a mode of transport in early times. Later, with the improvement of traffic conditions, salt trade between different regions was boosted, and long-distance food trade was also promoted, making communication between different cultures more frequent and. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check.